Now, uh, let's welcome our next presenter, Greta from MIT. Hi, Greta. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Great. Let me try to share my screen. Thanks for the talk. Great. Does this look fine? Yep. So awesome. when you share screen, don't uh, don't forget to share the sound if you have any video clips in your presentation. Sounds good. Thanks. I actually don't. So that makes things easier. Hopefully less technical difficulties. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this work today. Uh, I'm Greta. I'm a PhD candidate at the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department at MIT. I study how humans extract meaning from text and speech using tools from artificial intelligence. And the high level goal of this project is to obtain a better understanding of the human language network by driving and suppressing neural responses in this network with the help of large language models. And first, let me try to unpack that a bit. First of all, what is the system that we are investigating? While you are listening to these words, uh, you are engaging the language network in your brain. This is a set of regions in the frontal and temporal part of the brain. In the left hemisphere in most individuals, here shown by these uh, red um, demarcations on the inflated uh, brain surface. The color here shows the probability of a voxel, a given location in the brain, to be selective to language, meaning that that part of the brain responds to linguistic input, such as naturalistic sentences versus strings of non-words or degraded speech. So these regions are sensitive to word and sentence level meanings. And here we estimated this map across 800 participants. So um, everyone, uh, uh, most individuals, um, have uh, this uh, frontal temporal uh, network in the brain that uh, we use to process language. This network is known to support language comprehension and production of both spoken, written and signed languages. And this network is very selective for language relative to various other inputs, meaning that other types of input such as music or arithmetic won't engage this network. And finally, if parts of this network are damaged in adulthood, we end up with linguistic deficits. However, even though we know that this network supports language processing, many aspects of the representations and algorithms that actually support language comprehension remain unknown. Basically, what is going on in this network when we process language? And this is the question that we try to tackle with the help of large language models. Moving on to the language models, how do they come into play? How are they relevant to this question? First of all, large language models, LLMs, are trained to predict the next word. Next, LLMs have been shown to be predictive of brain responses during language processing. Then, given that we now have these models, the LLMs that are able to predict brain responses during language processing, can we then leverage the predictive power of LLMs to identify new stimuli to maximally drive or suppress brain responses in the language network? So this is the main question. Here we try to ask, can we identify new stimuli, some kind of sentences that will drive the responses up in this language network? Meaning that some kind of input, for instance, here I show a sentence, my skin feels like melting wax. Would that kind of input drive the responses up? Or conversely, can we find some kind of sentences that would suppress the responses in this network to lower the responses um, as much as we possibly can? Uh, and by asking this question, we tap into two sub questions. One is, are LLMs accurate enough to non-invasively non control brain responses implicated, implicated in higher level cognition, such as the language network? Second, what kinds of linguistic input is the language network most responsive to? And this logic of understanding a brain region or a neuron better 
by figuring out what it is most responsive to is, of course, not new. And the idea that neurons um, have certain stimuli that they respond more strongly to than others uh, dates back to the pioneering work of Hubel and Wiesel, who demonstrated how some neurons are more responsive to various orientations of the stimuli. In that way, this is the same logic that we try to apply here, just to the language network in the brain. So first of all, let me try to go over the approach, followed by results, and then some conclusions and perspectives. So the approach here, as I mentioned, is to build a predictive model of how the language network responds to any arbitrary sentence. Then we want to use this predictive model to identify sentences that elicit maximal activity or minimal activity in this network. The sentences that elicit maximal activity I'll denote as drive sentences, and they will be shown in red in this presentation, while the sentences that we want to elicit minimal activity, uh, we denote suppressed sentences, and I show them in blue in this presentation. So first, uh, let me go over how we build this predictive model. We have a set of humans, in this case, five uh, individuals, that are exposed to 1,000 diverse sentences, and we record their brain responses in fMRI. For each single participant, we obtain the response for each single of these 1,000 sentences. And then, because we are interested in building a model that can predict the response to the sentences in any arbitrary human's brain, then we average the responses across these five participants in the language selective regions. That means that for each single sentence, we end up with one value of how this network responds. Is the response high or low to any given of these 1,000 sentences? On the modeling side, we also have our LLM, our large language model, uh, in this case, GPT-2XL, which um, we also expose to the same 1,000 sentences. And then we record the internal unit activations, the representations of this network, while this network is processing the same 1,000 sentences that the humans were exposed to. In that way, we can leverage the activations from GPT to fit an encoding model that can then predict the activation associated with each single sentence. So that means that this model can take as input any sentence and output the predicted language network response. So this is a very, very useful predictive model. Now let me move on to the second part of the approach, which is now we want to leverage this predictive model to identify these sentences that we hope will elicit strong or low activity in the language network. So now we want to identify the sentences, the drive or the suppressed sentences, and we do that by looking across many, many sentences, in this case, 1.8 million sentences that are extracted from various text corpora. For each of these uh, 2 million sentences, we feed these sentences through our model, GPT, and then we obtain the representations associated with each of these almost 2 million sentences. And now we can leverage our predictive model to generate predicted brain responses for each single of these almost 2 million sentences. That means that across all these sentences, we can obtain a predicted brain response. And this prediction means what is the associated brain activity uh, with given the sentence as uh, fitted by our predictive model. Then, because we are interested in obtaining sentences that either drive or suppress this network, we can then sort our predictions. Up here, we might have the uh, sentences that uh, have the highest um, predicted responses. And on the other hand, we can have the sentences that are associated with the lowest predictions. Then uh, we uh, can take the top 250 uh, sentences and the lowest 250 sentences. And now we want to record uh, brain activity to these new drive and suppress sentences in new participants. So that means that we are asking, can we use these models like the sentences to drive or suppress responses in the brains of new participants? And this can be thought of as a type of non-invasive control of brain activity. And you might imagine that it, this could be tricky. Um, 
because we are trying to generalize to new individuals and also we are operating um, on in the domain of language and the language network extracts uh, abstract meaning representations um, which is um, of course a tricky thing to model in addition to these drive and suppress sentences we also collect data uh, for these um, baseline sentences which are 1000 sentences that are sampled from various naturalistic corpora so now I'm going to show you uh, the identified uh, drive sentences that our model predicted would have high brain responses in the language network. Here are a couple of examples. Uh, just to point out a few, um, one is people on Insta be like gross, or Turin loves me not, nor will. On the other hand, uh, we also have the suppressed sentences, um, which could, for instance, be they walked out onto the balcony or what else is there to do? And finally, we have the set of uh, naturalistic baseline sentences, and these are simply sentences extracted from various naturalistic corpora. Great, so now let me move on to the results. Here, I'm showing the condition level responses to the drive sentences in red and the suppressed sentences in blue and the baseline over here. And we collected these responses in three new participants uh, to these 1,500 sentences in total. And the y-axis shows the z-score at bold response. And as we can see, as predicted, uh, our drive sentences elicit strong responses in the language network, and our suppressed sentences managed to actually suppress the activity in this network. So by that, we can conclude that these models like the sentences successfully drive and suppress brain responses in the language network of new individuals. And uh, we recorded these brain responses in an event-related fMRI design, which means that each single sentence is presented as its own condition. So there's a sentence, then there's a small break, a sentence, a small break. To validate that these findings uh, would generalize to other experimental paradigms, we also collected um, the responses to drive and suppress sentences in a more traditional blocked fMRI design. And we saw, again, that these drive and suppress sentences are actually able to control the responses in the language network as we had predicted. So this is on the condition level. And now, because we collected responses to individual sentences, we can look at these individual sentence level responses. And by that, we can ask two questions. One is, how accurate was our model at predicting responses to individual sentences? And the second one, what are the individual sentences that elicit the highest or lowest brain responses? So now I'll be showing you a scatter plot of the sentence level brain responses versus the predictions from the model. And that is the plot that we're looking at here. On the x-axis, we have the uh, predictive models uh, predictions of what the uh, brain response uh, would be. And that's why we have this clustering of these red drive sentences on the right. These sentences were designed to elicit as high activity as possible. And on the other end of the x-axis, we have the blue suppressed sentences that were designed to elicit minimal activity in this network. And um, the, the gray sentences here are the naturalistic baseline sentences. They're pretty widely distributed on this scale. On the y-axis, we have the averaged um, z-scored ball response from the three participants that we collected uh, data from. And uh, first of all, we can ask, uh, how good is the performance of this model? We see that the correlation is indeed positive. And in simulations, we quantified that this is 69% uh, of the theoretically obtainable correlation given inter-participant variability and measurement noise. And then second, we can appreciate what are the sentences that actually elicit highest activity in the language network. And the highest um, eliciting sentence is, I am progressive and you fall, right? And some of the sentences that would elicit very low responses would be a sentence like, she wore a short black dress. And now the key question that I started out with is, well, why do some sentences elicit higher brain responses than others? Can we learn more about this network by quantifying what is actually special about the sentences that elicit high responses versus low responses? So to do that, we collected um, 
sentence ratings from uh, MTurk, from crowdsourced participants, uh, where, uh, which I'm showing on the x-axis here, where for each single sentence that we collected data for, we asked uh, MTurk, MTurk workers to provide a rating, for instance, on the grammaticality or the plausibility of the sentence. Here, lower numbers are less grammatical or less plausible, and higher numbers are more grammatical and more plausible. And on the y-axis, we have, again, the uh, bold response, the brain responses that were collected. And these graphs um, show the sentence level responses, where each single uh, point is a sentence. The insets here show the um, average uh, brain responses in the bins according to the ratings. So first of all, uh, on these two scatter plots, we can see that sentences that are in the mid range of grammaticality and plausibility elicits the highest brain responses. We see this um, inverted U shape. That means that the language network responds strongly to sentences that are normal enough to engage it, but weird enough to tax it. So it means that in general, sentences that are unusual, they might have a weird grammat grammatical structure, they might be implausible, they will elicit higher brain responses due to their unexpected form and or meaning. But if a sentence is highly ungrammatical and very implausible, and it does not adhere enough to the natural statistics of language, then the system does no longer respond to it. Another feature that we investigated was the emotional valence. And uh, the trend that we uh, evidenced here was that sentences with negative content um, here on this end of the axis elicit higher brain responses. And the final feature that I want to talk about here is imageability, which is how easy is a given sentence to visualize. Um, and the trend that we found here was also negative, meaning that sentences that are abstract and hard to visualize elicit higher responses. And uh, by that, I want to uh, provide a few conclusions and perspectives. And here I'm putting up uh, the initial uh, main question slide that I had. And for the first sub question, are LLMs actually accurate enough to non-invasively control brain responses implicated in higher level cognition, such as the language network? We saw that yes, they actually are. We are able to provide to use these models as tools to generate stimuli that can drive or suppress brain responses. And for the next question um, about what kinds of linguistic input is the language network most responsive to, uh, basically what kind of stimuli drives the system the most, we found that uh, these sentences that have these unusual grammatical structures and somewhat odd meanings uh, really drive the system, but they can become too unusual. Um, so that means that the system is operating on this scale of like if there's enough, if there's some interesting information to extract, then this network will work hard to do that. But if the input becomes too uh, ill formed, the network will no longer respond. And we also found that uh, sentences that have negative contact or are very abstract and hard to visualize also elicit high responses. And uh, we put out this paper as a preprint very recently um, with these brilliant collaborators, and uh, we investigated a couple of other features and a bunch of other analyses, so you can check that out if you're interested. And I just want to finalize uh, with this perspective slide that within Audition, we have deep neural network models that can accurately predict brain responses in the auditory cortex. And a couple of studies have shown this over the last few years. And in recent work uh, in collaboration with Janelle Fetter, Dana Bobinger, and Josh McDermott, we quantified how different deep neural network models here on the x-axis can predict the responses of auditory cortex voxels. And we found that actually many of these deep neural, deep neural network models are very good at predicting the responses in uh, the auditory cortex. And that means that uh, this leaves um, interesting alleys of work of using these deep neural network models for audio to potentially provide a high fidelity control of subdivisions within the auditory cortex.
And by that, I'll say thanks a lot for listening and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Thanks. Hi, Greta. Great talk. Thank you. It's very interesting. So um, I've got a couple questions in the chat. So John Great. William was asking, what was the task for the participants when they listened to the sentences? So when they rate the sentences, like how did you instruct them? What, what were they required to do during the task? Right, uh, thanks for the question. So regarding uh, rating and obtaining these norms for the sentences, um, they were instructed to, first we provide an example. Um, uh, now we want you to provide a rating from one through seven of how easy a sentence is to visualize. And then we provide an example of a very concrete sentence, you know, the apple is on the table or some more abstract sentence, I am lonely. Um, and then we ask these uh, MTREC raters to then provide these ratings. And for the fMRI task, uh, participants were asked to read the sentence and think about its meaning and pay attention. So there was no explicit task in the fMRI paradigm uh, because we wanted to try to make this as, as close as possible to a more naturalistic paradigm. Thank you, that was very clear. And another question from Sebad is that, did you run your predictive model on actual clinical sentences to know if there are more drive slash baseline slash surprise um, surprise characteristics, which will be the impact on on the clinic if there's a tendency towards one of them? Yeah, because um, in the in the clinical, uh, especially for audiology, sometimes we test um, the speech and noise performance to kind of. Um, evaluate how good the participant or the patient can, uh, can do speech understanding, especially in noisy environments. So some of the commonly used materials include uh, hearing noise tests and also the Isabel sentences. Uh, those, uh, those speech materials were designed um, phonetically balanced and all, also they say that it's, um, they have an equal difficulty in terms of the grammar, so um, also, I'm always very um, curious about that too. Like, if you run your model on those materials, would they would it predict different brain responses to a particular sentence versus the others? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, just one note before I start answering. Uh, in this paradigm, we actually had participants read, um, but in the language network, which is uh, responding to both the auditory and the visual modality, there shouldn't be a big difference, but just want to make that clear. Um, I'm sorry if that wasn't uh, incredibly clear from my talk. And um, my answer to the question is that no, I have not run uh, this predictive model on the clinical sentences. I actually never really thought about that uh, before, um, but it's very, very doable. And I think that does demonstrate the strength of these predictive models because we can take input any sentence, right? There's not limited to any kinds of vocabulary or anything. These LMs are able to take any given word and just provide the representation for it. So that should definitely be, um, that's definitely doable. And um, yeah, we can see what the predictions would be. Yeah, I, I'm not going to fill that space. Keep that potion <laughs> yeah. once you run your model on those sentences because we are, because yeah. your yeah. research apparently That's is very suggestion. attractive. Yeah, it's very interesting. And one more question. Uh, this is very creative. Is that could you use your model to rate one's presentation? Like how easy it is to listen to an instructor? For example, your style of creating sentences just based on the model prediction. Like um, you mentioned in your presentation that if something unusual pop up um, in a sentences, the listeners tend to give a um, higher, more active brain responses, right? So that means that if like if you run the model to someone's lecture and then <laughs> it showed up a very active brain responses, doesn't mean that the instructor's not doing a good job of conveying the information. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a fun question. Um, say that we have a lecture and then we run that through the predictive model, then we would be able to get a proxy for when the language network is working hard, when the responses are high. Um, and 
when the responses are low, you could probably get a good idea as to when people are maybe checking their phones or them, um, when like this, the content is not as like stimulating or exciting because we do see that in sentences where there's there as they're surprising that there seems to be a lot of information to extract from, then the responses go higher. Um, so I guess if if I were to structure a lecture using that method, I'll probably try to like create some kind of somewhat uniform density of the spread across the lecture so you wouldn't completely lose <laughs> um, the students. But um, yeah, that's that's a fun one. I guess it could be used in more educational um, aspects. Yeah, thank you for the answer. And uh, OK, one more question. Do you expect a sentence will affect the next sentence like coherence in a story? Yep, that's that's a very, very important one. And in this particular paradigm, we say that one sentence is its own unit, which is, of course, a big assumption because usually in all kinds of language processing, almost we rely a lot on, on prior context. And this paradigm, we try to simply isolate the sentence level response. There's a short break and participants are aware that it's not a coherent story. So we try to ignore the effect of context and we also randomize sentences across participants so that of course helps but it is a big assumption and of course in uh, more ecologically valid settings then we do rely a lot on context and my prediction is that um, if uh, we feed prior context in the model then it should be able to account for whether something is surprising or not Right, there's this classical example where if you hear a sentence like um, the peanut fell in love, then that's super surprising. That's like a weird sentence. But if you first heard a story about like the peanut, you know, this and this, and you have a lot of prior context, then that sentence that I mentioned first is not going to be surprising. And if the model, and here I'm talking about GPT, is able to provide a good enough representation of context, then the predictions for the brain response should be able to go up and down accordingly. Um, but that is, as I just said, um, dependent on whether GPT can provide the context in a meaningful way, which I have not tested. Yeah, thank you. Um, so based on the previous question, OK, I promise this is the last question. Yeah, no. no <laughs> so I'm based on all that, um, have you tried sentences from a foreign language or random text in addition to the baseline? Because I, I think this question is uh, pretty much related to the context we talked about earlier, because the random um, a foreign language that the participant may not know could be something surprising, but also on the other hand, it could be something that may not elicit a language, um, linguistic processing of the brain. So in that case, would you predict that your model would give and super active or surprised response? I think that um, the model for foreign language input, I have not tested it, but for foreign language input, I believe that the current model would predict that to elicit high response just because it's like odd and it's there's, you know, it's, it's different in that sense, but that's a fault of the model. So when uh, we fitted this model, we mostly had pretty naturalistic linguistic input. So we actually did not include these like very, very odd strings or foreign language or word lists. Um, had we done that, I think we would have been able to get the model to predict that very like random word list or foreign um, text would elicit lower responses, which I do predict would be um, empirically the case. But I don't think the current state of the model would actually get at that. And that's a fault of the predictive model. Yeah, I feel the same. Well, thank you for answering all the questions. Um, your yeah, talk is very, very interesting. We have enjoyed it.